Hi everyone, in this video we are going to learn about Onion architecture and what are its advantages. We will show a RESTful API project that follows the Onion architecture with ASP.NET Core. After the initial explanation and the project presentation, we will talk about the advantages of this architecture and why should you use it, so try to stick to the end of the video. Let's get started. So, what is the Onion architecture? It is a form of layered architecture and we can visualize these layers as concentric circles. So, let's go ahead and look at each layer with more detail to see why we are introducing it and what are we going to create inside of that layer. There are multiple ways that we can split the onion, but the following approach is the most commonly used where we split the architecture into four layers. Domain layer, service layer, infrastructure layer and the presentation layer. Conceptually, we can consider that the infrastructure and presentation layers are on the same level of the hierarchy. Now, when we talk about this architecture, we must mention the flow of dependencies as it is one of the most important parts to talk about. The main idea behind the Onion architecture is the flow of dependencies, or rather, how the layers interact with each other. The deeper the layer resides inside the Onion, the fewer dependencies it has. The domain layer does not have any direct dependencies on the outside layers. It is isolated in a way from the outside world. The outer layers are all allowed to reference the layers that are directly below them in the hierarchy. We will see exactly that in our project presentation. We can conclude that all the dependencies in the Onion architecture flow inwards. But we should ask ourselves, why is this important? The flow of dependencies dictates what a certain layer in the Onion architecture can do. Because it depends on the layers below it, in the hierarchy, it can only call the methods that are exposed by the lower layers. We can use lower layers of the Onion architecture to define contracts or interfaces. The outer layers of the architecture implement these interfaces. This means that in the domain layer, we are not concerning ourselves with infrastructure details, such as the database or external services. Using this approach, we can encapsulate all of the rich business logic in the domain and service layers without ever having to know any implementation details. In the service layer, we are going to depend only on the interfaces that are defined by the layer below, which is the domain layer. Now, with all this said, it is right time to take a look at our project. As you can see, it consists of the main project, which is our ASP.NET Core application, and six class libraries. The domain project will hold the domain layer implementation. The services and service abstractions are going to be our service layer implementation. The persistence project will be our infrastructure layer, and the presentation project will be presentation layer implementation. So, let's start with the domain layer. The domain layer is at the core of the Onion architecture. In this layer, we typically define the core aspects of our domain, entities, repository interfaces, and exceptions. These are just some of the examples of what we could define in the domain layer. We can be more or less strict, depending on our needs. We have to realize that everything is a trade-off in software engineering. Let's start by looking at the owner class. The entities defined in the domain layer are going to capture the information that is important for describing the problem domain. At this point, we should ask ourselves what about the behavior? Isn't an anemic domain model a bad thing? Well, it depends. If you have very complex business logic, it would make sense to encapsulate it inside of our domain entities. But for the most applications, it is usually easier to start with a simpler domain model and only introduce complexity if it is really required by the project. Next, we are going to look at the iOwner repository interface inside the repositories folder. This is the interface with all the contracts for the repository class that we will inherit from this interface. Inside the same folder, we can also find the iUnitOfWork interface. 
Notice that we are setting the cancellation token argument as an optional value and giving it the default value. With this approach, if we don't provide an actual cancellation token value, a cancellation token dot none will be provided for us. By doing this, we can ensure that our asynchronous calls that use the cancellation token will always work. Now, let's look at some of the custom exceptions that we have inside the exceptions folder. There is an abstract bad request exception class and the abstract not found exception class. There is also a specific owner related class which is sealed. This means we can use our abstract classes to implement specific exceptions for exceptional situations like when a bad request arrives or we can find a resource as the case is here. These exceptions will be handled by the higher layers of our architecture. We are going to use them in a global exception handler that will return the proper HTTP status code based on the type of exception that was thrown. If you are interested in learning more about how to implement global exception handling, be sure to watch our global error handler video, the link will be in the description below. At this point, we understand how to define the domain layer. Also, we can check it has no dependencies on other layers. That said, we can move on to the service layer and see how to use it to implement the actual business logic. The service layer sits right above the domain layer, which means that it has a reference to the domain layer. The service layer is split into two projects, service abstractions and services. In the service abstractions project, you can find the definitions for the service interfaces that are going to encapsulate the main business logic. It references the share project, which we use to define the data transfer objects or DTOs that we are going to consume with the service interfaces. That said, let's first look at the iOwner service interface. All of these are simple contracts for our service class that will implement this interface. Additionally, we can see that there is an iService Manager interface that acts as a wrapper around all the interfaces that we can create in the Service Abstractions project. For now, we have only one, but you get the point. If you have multiple interfaces, and you will in the larger projects, you only have to use this interface to access different methods from different interfaces. Next, we're going to look at how to implement this interface inside of the services project. So, this is a regular business logic where we consume the repository logic and add other business stuff needed for the project. Again, everything we regularly do inside the service layer. We can also inspect the service manager class that implements the iService Manager interface. The interesting part with the service manager implementation is that we are leveraging the power of the lazy class to ensure the lazy initialization of our services. This means that our service instances are only going to be created when we access them for the first time and not before that. Now, you may ask, why are we going through so much trouble to split our service interfaces and implementations in two separate projects? As you can see, we mark the services implementations with the internal keyword, which means they will not be publicly available outside of the services project. On the other hand, the service interfaces are public. Uh, do you remember what we said about the flow of dependencies? With this approach, we are being very explicit about what the higher layers of the onion can and cannot do. Also, it is easy to miss here that the service abstractions project does not have a reference to the domain project. This means that when a higher layer references the service abstractions project, it will only be able to call methods that are exposed by this project. We are going to see why this is very useful later on when we get the presentation layer. Also, if we check the dependencies inside the service project, you will see we only have domain and service abstractions project referenced. 
Now, about the infrastructure layer. This layer should be concerned with encapsulating anything related to external systems or services that our application is interacting with. These external services can be database, identity provider, messaging queue or email service. There are much more examples, but hopefully you get the idea. We are hiding all the implementation details in the infrastructure layer because it is at the top of the Onion architecture while all of the lower layers depend on the interfaces or abstractions. So, let's start with the persistence project. First, we can see the Entity Framework database context in the repository DB context class. As you can see, the implementation is extremely simple. However, in the onModelCreating method, we are configuring our database context based on the entity configurations from the same assembly. Next, we are going to look at the entity configurations that are implementing the iEntity type configuration T interface. Great, now that the database context is configured, we can move on to the repositories. We are going to look at the repository implementations inside the repositories folder. The repositories are implementing the interfaces that we defined in the domain project. This is a basic repository logic where we use the DB context to work with the database data. Of course, you can find the repository manager class that uses the same implementation model as the service manager class we saw a bit earlier. If you want to learn more about implementing the repository pattern, you can check out our video. The link will be in the description below. Great, we're done with the infrastructure layer and now we only have one more layer left to complete our ONI architecture implementation. The presentation layer. The purpose of the presentation layer is to represent the entry point to our system so that consumers can interact with the data. We can implement this layer in many ways, for example, creating a REST API, gRPC, etc. When we use a regular web API project, we use it to create a set of RESTful API endpoints for modifying the domain entities and allowing consumers to get back the data. However, here we are doing something different from what you are normally used to when creating web APIs. By convention, the controllers are defined in the controllers folder inside the web API application. But as you can see, we don't have it here. Why is this a problem? Because ASP.NET Core uses dependency injection everywhere, we need to have a reference to all of the projects in the solution from the web application project. This allows us to configure our services inside the program class. While this is exactly what we want to do, it introduces a big design flaw. What is preventing our controllers from injecting anything they want inside the constructor? Well, nothing. So, how can we impose some strict rules about what the controllers can do? If you look again at how we split the service layer into the service abstractions and services projects, that was one piece of the puzzle. The second part is creating a project called presentation and giving it a reference to Microsoft ASP.NET Core.app so that it has access to the controller base class. Then we can create our controllers inside this project. That said, let's look at the owner's controller inside the controllers folder. You can see clean controllers without handling exceptions here because we have them globally handled and also we are using the iServiceManager class. So, it is obvious that the presentation project only references the service abstractions project. And since the service abstractions project does not reference any other project, we have imposed a very strict set of methods that we can call inside of our controllers. The obvious advantage of the ONI architecture is that our controllers methods become very thin, just a couple of lines of code at most. This is the true beauty of the ONI architecture. We moved all of the important business logic to the service layer. So now, we have to use this controller in our main application. To connect all the dots, 
let's open the main app and inspect the program class. We have registered our service and repository interfaces as services. We did the same with the DB context. And lastly, we use the add application part method to connect our presentation project. Without this line of code, the web API would not work. This line of code will find all the controllers inside of the presentation project and configure them with the framework. They are going to be treated the same as if they were defined conventionally. You can also see we use the assembly reference class to point to the assembly of the presentation project. That's the main purpose of that class. If you also look here in the pipeline part of the program class, we can see we register the exception handler. The implementation is inside the middleware folder. Notice that we create a switch expression around the exception instance and then perform a pattern matching based on the exception type. Then we modify the response HTTP status code depending on what the specific exception type is. Now, after we have our architecture implemented, let's take a look at what are the advantages of ONI architecture and why we would want to implement it in our projects. First, all of the layers interact with each other strictly through the interfaces defined in the layers below. The flow of dependencies is towards the core of the onion, and we already mentioned why this is important at the beginning of this video. Second, using dependency inversion throughout the project, depending on abstractions, interfaces, and not on the implementations, allows us to switch out the implementation at runtime transparently. We are depending on abstractions at compile time, which gives us strict contracts to work with, and we are being provided with implementation at the runtime. Also, the stability is very high with the Onion architecture because everything depends on abstractions, and the abstractions can be easily mocked. Lastly, we can write business logic without concern about any of the implementation details. If we need anything from an external system or service, we can just create an interface for it and consume it. We do not have to worry about how it will be implemented. The higher layers of the onion will take care of implementing the interfaces transparently. Great, I hope you now have a clear picture of the advantages of this architectural pattern and how to implement it in your project. That said, let's finish the video. If you like the content, please hit that like button and subscribe. Your support is highly appreciated. Of course, there's that bell button you can click to get notifications from our channel. Thank you for watching and I hope to see you in the next video. Until then, all the best.